Well, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, as Roy was saying, my name is Josh. I'm one of the um, elders or pastors at Dremoyne Baptist, uh, a little bit further away from here. And um, I've known about your church for a while, and particularly during the transition period with Roy, uh, and even with before that, I'm praying for Matt Murray as well. Um, yes, this church has been in my prayers. So it's wonderful to finally be here and I'll be amongst you all. We're going to be looking at God's Word from Luke chapter 12. So if you have one of the black church Bibles, you can find that on page 1010. Page 1010. Luke 12, reading verses 13 to 21. But before we read, let's come before our God in prayer. Let's pray. Indeed, precious God, we praise your holy name. And we say with the seraphim, holy, holy, holy is Yahweh God of hosts. The whole, the whole earth is full of your glory. And Lord, we pray, even as we look at your word, that indeed, Lord, our minds would be lifted above ourselves this morning. And that we would be th filled with thoughts, high and holy thoughts of you, O Lord. That you would encourage us this morning, Lord. That our thoughts would be weaned off this world. And that our hearts would be fully centered on you, our portion and our inheritance. Be with us, we pray, this morning. And give us understanding so that we may behold wondrous things in your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke 12, from verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life, take life easy. Eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. This is the word of the Lord. Money, money, money. The world is intoxicated with it. We have lists of the richest men and women in the world. We have success stories of, of famous and influential and rich people, and we love do we not? We love hearing about how they went from rags to riches. And sometimes we want to kind of find out how they did it so we could maybe find an easy, quick way to, to get rich and then we'll be okay. As the famous quote goes, money makes the world go round. And our whole lives, even as believers, seems to be attached to it in some way or another, whether we have a little bit or whether we have a lot of it. Our lives seem to be attached to it. And out of all the needless anxieties in life, out of all the anxieties in life, financial stress is up there, is it not, as one of the things that causes the most stress for us personally, for our families, for our nation, whatever it is. What we will eat, what we'll wear, what we, what we can buy, what we can't buy. And so we'll be looking at the parable of the rich fool this morning. And the central theme or the central teaching that's brought out by Jesus in this parable is that we must be rich towards God and not greedy for gain in the world. We must be rich toward God 
and not greedy for gain in this world. And so as we go through this passage, the first three verses from verses 13 to 15 will be on the greed condemned. Then the next five verses, verse 16 to 20, will be the greed illustrated by Christ. And then lastly, in the last verse, the greed replaced. But have a look with me. The first thing, the greed condemned, verses 13 to 15. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Now, Jesus had just been talking to his disciples. And if you have a look at verse 1 of this chapter, there were crowds of many thousands that are gathered around Christ. And I'm sure you've had this scenario where you've been at at an event, a big one, where there have been thousands of people pressing and, and jostling around you and it's cramped, it's, it's, it's tired and it can be really hot and, and, and you just, you just, sometimes you just want to be free from it. But it's not only that there are many thousands there, there are so many thousands that they're trampling on one another. That's a lot of people. A lot of them. And yet, in verse 4, Jesus narrows his focus to those who are his friends his disciples, because there were many that seemed to outwardly follow Christ. And yet Jesus had, message, had, had particular messages that were more for those who were closer to him or those who were his disciples. End of verse 1. Well, in verse 1, it says, He began to speak first to his disciples in distinction from the crowds. And so Jesus tells them about watching out for false teaching, fearing God above man, watching out for, uh, for persecution, acknowledging Christ before persecutors. And in the midst of this serious teaching of these spiritual concerns that Christ is bringing, this man out of nowhere interjects with this, this worldly issue. He doesn't even address what Jesus is saying. He doesn't even say, excuse me, sorry, I just, I just have a really important thing to say. No, he just says, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, if you're someone important, or anyone in fact, this would be rude. It is rude. But for someone like Christ, who deserves to be listened to above all else, it's extremely rude. Because Jesus himself is he's God himself, is he not? Is he not the great teacher, the rabbi that even this this man acknowledged? He said, teacher. But he had no desire to listen to what Christ had been saying. Was this not the beloved son of God, whom whom the father had said himself, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. But this, this man didn't want anything with this prophet. He didn't want to listen to any of those spiritual concerns that Christ was eager to teach his disciples and his friends. No, he interjected with a a worldly concern. And this showed the state of his heart. All he could think about was, was not what Christ had been saying, but about his issue. And yet, isn't our Lord amazing? He doesn't even break his stride. He's not even he's not even flummish. He's not even you know, confused or in that sense, he's not even thrown by what the man says. He then turns what the man says again into another spiritual lesson, not only for this man, but also for his disciples, that they watch out, that they be on their guard. So what does this man say? He says, teacher, verse 13, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. At least he uses a term of respect when he calls Jesus teacher. But what's he talking about there? Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Well, in Deuteronomy 21.17, the, the firstborn son, right? If a man had sons, the firstborn of those sons was to be given a double portion compared to the other sons. So if you had three sons, the inheritance would be split into four, and that firstborn son would get twice of what the other two sons would get. And so there wasn't that even share if you like. And we don't know whether this man was the 
firstborn son or not the firstborn son. And it maybe seems that he's not the firstborn son. But either way, does it matter? Was it wrong for this man to want his share of the inheritance? No, not completely. It was legally due to him. In Deuteronomy, God had laid it out and how it should be. But Christ knows this man's heart. He didn't just want justice and fairness for something that had been unjustly done to him. He didn't just want right to to be done. But Jesus knew where his heart was. Have a look with me at verse 14. Did Jesus say, yes, you are right and I'll, 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 you know, I'll, I'll decide this for you? No, what does he say? Verse 14, Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Now, in these days, cases in dispute could often be settled by rabbis, which is presumably why this man called Jesus rabbi or teacher. But Jesus refused to be drawn into this man's legal hagglings. And dispute with his brother. He hadn't come to judge petty disputes on earth. That's not what he was going to judge, was it? He's not the judge merely of these these earthly matters where there's greed involved. In John 9, 39, Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Because what Jesus is saying is those who do not see by the world's standards, like the, like the tax collectors and the Pharisees, they would see. Many of them would see and come to repentance in Christ. But those who claim they could see, like the Pharisees, and even this man who claimed to be on the right side of things, no, they were further hardened in their sin and blindness. In John 5, Jesus says, For the Father judges no one but has given all judgment to the Son that all may honour the Son just as they honour the Father. Whoever does not honour the Son does not honour the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Jesus' judging or judgment is not based on an earthly dispute between mankind, between humans but a dispute between God and man. That's the judging that Christ had come to do. And when it comes to that judgment, this man, he was hoping that there would be judgment in his favor. But when it comes to God's judgment on the final day, God always wins. God always wins. And Jesus had not come to share an earthly inheritance as it were. He came that men may have a heavenly inheritance. But all of this, did the man then suddenly go, you're right, thank you, you're right, I was being worldly minded. No, it just went whoosh, straight over this man's head. He had no idea. That's why Jesus said, verse 15, what does he say next? He says, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Now, when Jesus tells you to watch out, you watch out. When he, te- when he says, he who is ears to hear, you hear. When he says, behold, you watch. So when Jesus says, watch out, we are to watch. And notice he intensifies it. He doesn't say watch out, which would be enough, would it not? But he says, be on your guard. Be on your guard. This idea has has the idea of of literally a guard standing beside someone or something that they would guard. At the guards, that it was used for the guards that would stand and guard the Apostle Paul when he was in prison. And if those guards looked away for an extended period of time, if they shirked their duty, if they left their keys near near a prisoner, they were not doing their duty, were they? They were not guarding. That's their whole job, was to guard. And that's what Christ is saying. Be on your guard. Watch out. There's intense focus and concentration that is needed. Against what? 
Against what? Against all kinds of greed. All kinds of greed. Because greed doesn't just take one form, does it? There are many subtle hints of greed here and there. There are many different subtle ways that the devil will tempt us to greed. But that word greed, there is a desire for advantage or a grasping at something, a covetousness. An insatiable desire for more and more stuff. As was brought out excellently in the kids' talk before. A lack of contentment with what we have. 1 Timothy 6 says, Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senses and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. So what, Je- what is Jesus saying? He's saying, watch out. Be on your guard. And what does he say? For a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. <clears throat> so our happiness and comfort do not depend upon having great wealth or possessions in this world. And our life also is not to be lived as our primary pursuit in gaining more things. So the primary pursuit of our life, if I put it a slightly different way, is not to be, we're not to seek after the bread that perishes, as Christ put it, but like the bread that endures to eternal life. So I ask you here this morning, what is your life about? What does your life consist of? What is your driving force in your life? What is it that you want the most? Are you a worker here this morning? Why do you work? Is it just to get more things? Is it just to get more stuff? Is it just to give more things to your kids so they can have all the toys that the other kids in their class have? Or if you're beyond that age of working, what is it now? Is it to simply live off what you have and and, and keep it as much as you can? And not do anything for the kingdom with it? What is it? What do you ultimately want in life? It's not to say that having money is wrong. Far from it. The Lord in his sovereignty and his providence, he gives more to some and less to others. Otherwise, Job would be condemned, would he not? For being the richest man in the East. And it's not wrong to save money. Far from it. It's wise and prudent. But as we will see, it's the seeking after it. It's the, when we place that money and the desire to be rich as the ultimate priority in life. The greed, the covetousness that Christ is saying, watch out. I myself find myself sometimes drifting into this as I seek to provide for my family. I'm one income in Sydney. It's hard. You drift into this, this mindset sometimes. You just got to provide for your family. And above all else, that all the things of the Lord start to take the second place. And Jesus is saying, watch out against this excessive, inordinate striving after the things of this world. The abundance of possessions. Money. But who was it who Jesus singled out that it would be hard for them to enter the kingdom of heaven? Do you remember? It was the rich. Was it not? The rich. In Matthew 19, Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Even Jesus, of course, he, he knew. Because he knew the heart of man. He knew how many temptations come with riches. And financial security, as it were, so-called financial security. This is the deceitfulness of riches. Even in the parable of the four souls, what's the, what's the soil where the word is choked out? <clears throat> what are the weeds? Christ said it's the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. Indeed, money promises satisfaction the more we have. But all it leaves us is wanting more. And more and more. So Jesus said, Watch out. 
Are you intoxicated with the things of this world? Are your priorities earthly, worldly priorities? Have a think as we continue to go through the parable. Next, have, have a look. Verses 16 to 20, the greed illustrated by Christ. Have a look in verse 16. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat. Drink and be merry. Did you notice as I read through it, all the times that the personal pronouns are used? I, 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 me, my. I emphasized it for a reason because that's what Christ is doing here. He's emphasizing all of it. That this man, he's having a lovely old chat to himself, praising himself for all that his hands have done and will do. Now, was it good that his ground produced a good crop? Yes, it was good. Was it wrong for him to tear down his barns and build bigger ones? No. It's wise, it's prudent. Otherwise, it will go all to waste and spoil. It would have been silly for him not to do it. So why does Jesus condemn him? And as we go through these verses, I want to bring out six things. And maybe there are tendencies here that we all fall into, some maybe more than others. And these are the all kinds of greed that we are to watch out for. And are there any sins that you or I need to repent of? For indeed, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. Well, first, his self-sufficiency or self-dependency. And you notice this in the personal pronouns. Maybe have a look with me at verses 17 and 18 again. What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grains and my goods. Can you see what he's saying there? He says, look at what my hands have done. Look at me. My grain, my crops, my goods, my small to bigger barns. Me, look at me. He's being self-sufficient, self-dependent and self-glorifying as well. You may have heard that famous song by Frank Sinatra, I Did It My Way. It has these lines in it. He says, and now, I won't sing it for you. He says, and now the end is near. And so I face the final curtain. My friend, I'll say it clear. I'll state my case of which I'm certain. I've lived a life that's full. I traveled each and every highway. And more, much more than this, I did it my way. Is that the final phrase to be sung or stated before God on that final day? It's pathetic. Pathetic. What a pathetic life. Those words of the song, it says, I've lived a life that's full. No, he hasn't. No, he hasn't. He lived a life without God, with no thought to God. All he could think about was a life that he did it our way, and that song perfectly illustrates. I'm not having to go here at Frank Sinatra. It's a a song that illustrates the whole world. They did it their way. They will stand before God, and that's the account they will give to God. Their way, their salvation, their works, their goods, their crops, their barns, their riches. And it's no wonder God will cast them into hell for all eternity. They were self-sufficient and self-dependent, not dependent on God and his mercy and grace. As Matthew Henry said, what we have is but lent us for our use. 
the property or ownership is still in God. We are but stewards of our Lord's goods. Is this the way that you see your goods, your possessions, your money? It's God's. It's not yours. My, the money I have is not mine. That, that, that bank account balance, that's God's, not yours. But next is lack of thankfulness and honour given to God. This is the next kind of greed. His lack of thankfulness and, and honour given to God. Now the fruitfulness of the earth is a good thing given by, by God. And it's given to not just the just, but the unjust. Remember the verses it says that God sends his rain and he causes the sun to shine on the good and the wicked alike. God is good in giving these good gifts and yet all this man does, it shoves it back in God's face and says, look what I've done. He doesn't give thankfulness or honour to God. Romans 1 says that although mankind know there is a God, what does it say? They do not glorify him as God or give thanks to him. But they came, became futile in their thinking and they worshipped and served the creature rather than cre the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Paul couldn't even help in that, those short little verses talking about the wicked to then give glory to God. Because this rich man's first care was not to give thanks to God. Or honour God, but to honour himself. The clothes on his back, the barns, his house... Everything, God had given it to him in his providence, in his goodness, and yet he didn't thank God at all. Maybe this is one of the reasons why in the scriptures, one of the things that we are told to do again and again is to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. Not in some things, not on a thing now and then as we all are prone to do, but in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5 says, We are to give thanks to God at all times, for everything, however big and however small. When we have food on the table, we give thanks to God. When we can go down to a local supermarket, and we see just Everything laid out in abundance for us. Give thanks to God. When you have a job where you can provide for your family, or you had a job where you can provide for your family, thank God. When your bank account has any money in it, thank God. When we're given good, happy seasons, thank God. Even when things are tougher financially, thank God. And often those times... When it's tougher financially, it makes us realize how forgetful we were to thank God in those times and we did have more, does it not? Next, this man's presumption that his life would continue as it was. And connected with this, his trust in money, his security in money. Verse 19, first part, what does he say? And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? God says that this man is a fool. What's the world's judgment of this man, the world's verdict? Success. What's God's verdict? He's a fool. He's a fool. Because God doesn't judge by the world's standards, does he? And it was too late. It was too late. He was busy thinking about all the things he could do with his money. He thought that he was safe, that his life would not be required of him, that he had plenty of years ahead. He was not numbering his days, was he? God says, fool. He had no thought for eternity. James 4, verse 13 to 16 says this, Come now, you who, you who would say today or tomorrow will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. 
What is our lives, brethren? It's a mist. It's a vapor. Gone. It's like the dew that may have potentially gone on the grass for you know, two seconds this morning before it got hot. It's gone. And what does James call it? Arrogance, boasting. Remember in Ecclesiastes 2, which Roy read out for us before, verse 21, the writer says, Sometimes a person who is taught with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not tell for it. Is that not true? We can't take our gold and our possessions with us beyond the grave. I mean, kind of forget that there's much better beyond the grave. But have, brethren, have you lost sight of eternity? Have you forgotten the shortness of your life? Have you forgotten that this very night your, your soul may be required of you? Not necessarily in judgment like this man. The Lord may still require your soul of you, of course, as a believer, and take you to be with him in glory. And yet have you forgotten that? The shortness of your life? What foolishness it is to try and build a life and amass a fortune that will go, can go in a second, or we will go in a second. Would this make you sad if you lost all your money just like that? Would it make you despair completely? It shouldn't. It shouldn't. For what profit is it if we gain the whole world but lose our soul? But what, what gave this man security? What kind of pushed out this, this idea of any thought of eternity? Well, it's, it was his money. His portion was in this life and his security was in what he had. And yet where should our portion be? Who should be our portion? God should be our portion. You read the Psalms. You read it elsewhere in Proverbs, Proverbs or elsewhere. That God is our portion and our cup. He holds our lot. Indeed, we have a beautiful inheritance, John, uh, Psalm 16 says. God is our portion and he transcends this life. Indeed, brethren, we're never to set our hopes on the uncertainty of riches. But we're to have thought for eternity. Resolve that God is your portion. Well, next, this man's worldliness. What does he say at the, the second part of <clears throat> verse 19? Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. This man loved his stuff. He loved his pleasure. Even as it says in 2 Timothy, he was a lover of pleasure rather than a lover of God. And how easy it is, brethren, for us to become like that, to love the ease and to love the pleasure more than we love the Lord. We can and should enjoy the good things of this life. Has not God given them for us to enjoy? Yes. But when we love the pleasure more than we love the God who gave us every good thing that we have, we're flipping it on its head. Brethren, we should love God. We should love God more than we love pleasure. But next, this man's selfishness. <clears throat> Because he had no desire to use it for God's glory or to be generous towards others. Because who receives, if you think about it, who receives this money when he's alive? Who's the, the beneficiary, the, the, uh, the recipient of all his goods? His barns. His barns get it. It's not that he says, I've got excess. I don't need to build bigger barns. I'm going to give the excess to the poor or to to my family or to the work of the Lord or whatever it is. He just builds bigger barns so that he can just hoard it even more. Is it wrong to save? I said before, no. But is it wrong to hoard it such that you don't use it for the glory of God and the good of others? Yes. That's the distinction. Have a look at what Jesus says in verse 21. The greed replaced. Jesus says, this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. 
Jesus here brings this last evil to mind. Storing up things for ourselves, but not being rich towards God. What is this storing up things for ourselves? Well, we've gone through that, but Jesus also calls it laying up treasures here on earth. This is another phrase Christ uses. But what's the opposite? What should we be doing? We are to be rich towards God. Rich towards God. And it was brought out again for us well in the, in the kids' talk before. But if you think about it this way, it's the opposite of all that that rich fool is doing. So if we want to be rich towards God, we are to be dependent on God. We are to realize that He is the one who provides for us and that everything we have is from Him. We are to thus be thankful for all that comes from His hand. We are to think upon everything not as ours, but as God's, to be used for His glory. We are to find our security not in our money and our wealth or the thing, the abundance of our possessions, but in God. We are to value God as our portion, not our goods. We are to think upon eternity and the shortness of our lives. And we're to be lovers of God rather than lovers of pleasure. And we're to be generous with our money and not hoarders of it. This last way of being rich towards God is actually brought out by Christ later in the chapter in verses 33 and 34. Jesus says, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted. When no thief comes near and no moth destroys, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We're to hold loosely onto the things of this earth and to place our security and treasure in the Lord. That's where our treasure is and that's where our hearts should be also. Brethren, I encourage you this morning, set your hope on the Lord. Watch out, as Christ said, be on your guard against all forms of greed. Rejoice in the riches that you have in Christ. Rejoice that you have a hope beyond the grave, that when God requires your soul of you, you will go to a heavenly paradise where the, the, the riches, as it were, are far beyond anything we can possibly imagine in this earth. But in saying that, God and Christ himself will be much, much more precious than anything else, the abundance of what we will have in heaven. For our treasure is in heaven, and our treasure is in God. But if you're here this morning and you are not a Christian, if you are putting your trust in the things of this life, if you're putting your trust in your security, in money or the things that you have, the Bible calls you a fool. A fool. That you do not give thought to your eternal state. That you do not give thought to whether or not you were right with the Lord. And your money on that final day will perish. It will vanish. All your hopes in this life will be dashed and gone if Christ is not your hope. Is that not what we sung? Christ, our only hope in life and death? If you're here this morning and you're not trusting in Christ, you do not have a hope in this life, a true hope, or in death. The Bible calls you a a fool. If you're banking on this life, if you're loving pleasure more than the Lord, the Bible calls you a fool. And you need to realize that you are serving and worshiping an idol rather than one true and living God through Jesus Christ. And so I say to you this morning, repent. Realize your sin and realize the, the verdict of God for you. And believe in Jesus Christ and he will save you. And he will deliver you from, this, from, from your sin and from your love of pleasure. And he will, bring with you, with, he will bring you with him to be with him when you die or when he comes back, whichever is first. Let's pray. Precious God, you are our portion and our cup. Indeed, the wicked have their portion in this life. But you are our portion. You are our inheritance. And we pray that our desires would not be to be rich. Our desires would not be for pleasure. 
for this life ultimately, ultimately. But Lord, we pray that our desire would be for you. That we would be like the man who finds the treasure hidden in the field and goes at once and sells all that he has, that he might buy that field. But we pray that we would treasure you and indeed we thank you that we have seen your glory and your preciousness in the face of your dear son. We pray that you would help us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. We pray that our security and our hope would always be indeed in you and indeed your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, for those here this morning who do not know Christ, oh Lord, have mercy on their souls. Deliver them from loving the world and loving the pleasures of this life. And Lord, we pray that indeed, indeed you would grant them repentance leading to life, that they would trust in Christ alone, that they would see their sin, that they would see the beauty and glory of Christ much, much more. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.